And good rainy Monday afternoon, folks. I'm Sean the Fork Chop Forker, alongside Lon Strickler, and you're listening to Arcane Radio on Monday, October the 13th, 2014. And today's going to be a good show for you. Uh, we're going to name the winner of the Truth Is Out There contest that we've been promoting here on the on the Arcane Radio, on the on the program, on our webpage, on our social media. And the winner will be known here momentarily. Lon, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing pretty well. Um, chasing raindrops just like you are. It's wet down here, too. Yeah, it is. But kind of sets the tone for October. I kind of like this month to be cool and dreary and fallish. I like I like the ambiance that we get from days like this. Yeah, I'm, I'm a fall guy anyway. I, you know, I like to change the weather and, uh, you know... My birthday's in October. My birthday's near Halloween. I'm not really a Halloween guy, but uh, and my anniversary's in October, so there's a lot of stuff going on. My anniversary is in October as well. Really yeah. close to Halloween, October 27th. Oh, huh, yeah, my birthday's the 28th. Well, there you go. See that? Two good things yeah. happen close together. Yeah. Those numbers, folks. Numbers are everything in this world. Uh, but the winner, I guess, Lon, will announce that the truth is out there contest coming from us way down from a land down under, uh, Alan Tiller is the winner of our Truth Is Out There contest. Yeah, Alan, I, I know Alan, actually. Alan, uh, he's got his own paranormal group down there, and uh, I'm glad he got it. it uh, we'll go ahead and I'll ship that right out to him. Excellent. And folks, uh, stay tuned for a next contest. You'll never know what we'll run. Uh, maybe sometime next month I'll run a special contest myself here and see if we can get you guys some more paranormal goodies. And, Lon, speaking of paranormal goodies, it's been a heck of a week for UFO sightings. Been a lot of UFO sightings, a lot of interesting UFO sightings. Yeah, uh, some uh. really good visual evidence uh, from some of these cases. The one you and I were talking about here right before we came on is a story I read this weekend the UFO sighting over Florida by a Carnival cruise ship. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty interesting. Uh, it kind of looks like a drone type thing, but it does. The shape is different than what I've seen before. It's more square. Um, now, of course, I'm not saying if it, you know, it may be military. It may be, uh, you know, I don't know how big it is. It's hard to really tell from from that. I don't know what the estimated the size was, but. Uh, it, it is an interesting looking thing, and uh, we'll have to wait and see if anybody else sees something similar. Yeah, I think I like the video. It, it's really cool looking. It looks man made to me. I mean, it doesn't look like something extraterrestrial. It could be. I don't know. I, I've, I've never seen anything extraterrestrial, I guess, to compare it to. But uh, nonetheless, it's still a UFO by definition, an unidentified flying object. But if we really want to get into UFOs that might be of extraterrestrial origin, then we need to go over to Ulan to talk about these things out of Clearfield County, Pennsylvania. Yeah, that, um, and I don't know if that's extraterrestrial or not. I mean, that looks like these, uh, you know, one of these triangular flying objects that everybody's been seeing. I mean, I, you know, this one's a tiny bit different. It seems like it's like something in the back of it, but then again, I mean, and I can't tell how really how big it is, but uh, it was a report put through MUFON, and uh, it was actually taken by ex-law enforcement officer. Uh, he said he just happened to see it out of the corner of his eye and snapped two photographs on his phone. It was a pretty clear photograph. Looks like it was kind of maybe hmm, sometime in the evening, getting ready to turn dark. I don't know. It's hard to tell. Not much. There wasn't a whole lot of information. Oh, I know this guy was in his backyard gardening, and uh, he just happened to see it and took some pictures. These photographs look kind of vintage here. I'm sorry. I was looking at them quick. Yeah. Uh, even the garage door mechanism in the one garage photo looks uh, uh, looks retro. Yeah. That. Um... That's pretty odd. You know, these, I don't know what the date, somebody suggested these came from 1962. Um, I, all I know is when it was posted, this was posted on MUFON as well. 
uh, out Ab- Albuquerque, New Mexico. And of course, that area is, it's, itself has had a lot of UFO activity over the years, and mm-hmm. there's some um, there are some underground bases supposedly there as well. And uh, but anyway, this this disc uh, is pretty similar to some of the uh, disc photos that came out of that era. Um, I, I like I said again, I can't really tell how big it was. It I don't know. It's I, it's it's hard to it's hard to describe other than saying it looks like a flying saucer. And, um, you know, going back to the triangular photos there that we're looking at, it, the thing, same thing about those and the Florida photographs, there's nothing to scale. You know, I guess yeah. that's what always makes aerial photos, you yeah. know, so difficult is that, you know, you can't put a ruler next to it because, well, that's not going to, you know, tell you much. It's, <laughs> it's, it's very difficult to get, unless there was another sort of, uh, object in the sky to measure up to. You can't get a definite size on this thing. Well, you know, the, the first one we were talking about, that squarish looking thing, mm-hmm. since it was down, it was close to the Keys, I think. Um, you know, that may be a spy drone coming back from Cuba or going toward Cuba. Could or be. Or something like I, You know, I just thought about that. Uh, I, I'm quite sure they do run drones a, across the island and... Uh, Maybe that's something. Maybe that's military. Well, we could hope. Yeah. Uh, that would make it a little bit more. Uh, I guess it would make it a little more, a little less mysterious, and kind of give us some answers as to what the flying objects are. Mm-hmm. You know, I can only imagine what would happen if you remember the story a while back of Amazon wanting to deliver packages via drones. <laughs> yeah. Could you imagine the UFO sightings? You know that would be going on if. Amazon start got clearance to use these UFO these UFOs these drones to deliver packages. Did, uh, did that thing fall through? It did fall through. I don't yeah, think that's going to happen. I it might have even been a joke. Down. I thought it might have been a joke too, but uh, that would have been a very confusing time for Mufon. Well, uh, the only thing I can think of that people not getting the deliveries because somebody else is shooting it out of the sky. <laughs> yeah, my neighbor shot this thing carrying a package out of the sky. <laughs> You can buy these drones yeah. at uh, Radio Shacks and Best Buys now. These uh, We saw one for about 300 bucks, Lon. It's radio controlled. You can fly uh-huh. it up in the sky for a little bit. And if you're not, and, and you doctor one of those things up a little bit, you could make some pretty, uh, pretty fun home videos out of those. So I guess it's time we start putting our skepticals on for a lot of these things because the drones are out there. Yeah, I, I am more skeptical of uh, UFO sightings than I ever was, and it's, it's basically because of that. And uh, you know, there just seems to be a lot of, you know, a lot of these sightings tend to look like something that maybe the government would use, and you know, a lot of them have a lot of lights on them, you know. So these radio controlled, you know, just like the helicopters and that other stuff, they all got a lot of lights on them. So, you know, you gotta be really cautious or wary of seeing when you see something like that. Well, you know, I guess the thing with UFOs lawn is when I was a kid, like anytime you heard the term UFO, it was, at least for me, it was extraterrestrial. Mm -hmm. I guess as an adult, and I think about it more and more now, I start going to more government and man-made things than extraterrestrial. That I guess it's funny just how the mind works. As you get older, you just start immediately rationalizing that eh, it's just something the government's tinkering with. Yeah. As opposed to it came from Neptune. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, um, but see, I come from that era when, you know, when there were UFO sightings. Mm Mm-hmm everybody fr- freaked out you know i was um you know i remember i i actually remember when betty and barney hill first uh came out with their abduction uh story and people were really freaked out that was big news back then oh yes <clears throat> that was really big news and uh, uh the first thing anybody you know anybody saw a ufo it was automatically extraterrestrial Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think the mindset, you know, of course, technology is caught up a lot to it. So I think the mindset is now to be much more skeptical, uh, to take a better look at it. Just don't dump 
jump to conclusions about it. Well, I'm a little skeptical to begin with. You know yeah. what I mean? I, I, I guess it's just me and my safety net. I'd rather disbelieve than believe right away. Mm-hmm. I like to convince myself that something exists, and if I can do that, then I, I'm pretty, uh, I, I'm pretty in, involved. And a lot of these things we've been talking about over the years, and you know, really have fallen into two categories for me anymore i guess i'm there's not a lot of things i'm wishy-washy about they've either they either within the realm of reason to exist or they're junk and i don't have anything in the middle at this point like if we come to a topic and we talk about it lon it's it's there it's Mm -hmm. practical it's possible or it goes in the junk bin Mm -hmm. yeah i i I agree with you on that you know the I, I tell you, out of, out of all the phenomena I look into, UFOs probably are near the bottom, basically because, well, there's a lot of other stuff here on Earth that is much more mysterious to me than UFOs. I mean, I UFOs agree. could be a lot of things. And uh, now, of course, I know a lot of people that investigate UFOs, and you know, I'm I'm directly associated with a lot of people that investigate UFOs, but. You know, it's not really my bag, but then again, you know, I do get a lot of odd UFO stories. And, of course, if it's tied in with the sighting of a humanoid or extraterrestrial or alien-type creature, well, then that's a bit different. But as far as just looking at lights in the sky and trying to figure out what it is, uh, you know, there are a lot more things I'd rather be doing. Well, that's really funny, though, because when I had first met you, I always thought you were a UFO guy. Mm-hmm. You know, because it was a lot that was on there. Well, not a lot that was on there. It was always kind of ghosts and spirits and those sort of things. But there were always a lot of the David Eckert stuff and the, uh, you know, just pictures of humanoid or the, you know, alien humanoids, uh, grays, that sort of thing. It's it's just funny. The more you learn over time, uh, I, I guess it's you, we, we really start finding out where we really fall into the the paradigm of what's really important in our own personal research. I'm not a UFO guy either. Mm-hmm. No, I, that, to me, I just I'd rather be stomping in the fields looking for Bigfoot, and at this point in my life, trying not to get Lyme's disease. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. You know what I mean? It's uh, I don't know. It's we. There's a lot of things out there that I'm really interested in, and I really want to start getting into and studying uh, this Mantis Man that people are seeing, I want to start learning a little bit more about this. I think there might be something to that. Maybe not a mantis man, but maybe there is a large type mantis prowling around out here somewhere. Well, I, you know, I don't know what it is. And of course now I've, I've been privy to three different Mm -hmm. sightings in the, the Hackettstown, New Jersey area. And in fact, one of the production companies that films for, um, Monsters and Mysteries in America are putting together a story for their new season. So they're looking for other witnesses as well. Uh, I don't know what this thing is. I, I don't think it's, well, I don't think it's natural, you know. Uh, but then again, you you know, you don't know what it is. I mean, you know, I, I the only thing, I, the only stories I have gotten, are, and they're all fairly similar, is that this thing has got some size to it. It looks like it looks like an insectoid type being that's that looks more like a a, a praying mantis, mm-hmm. um, and it moves like a praying mantis would move, but it just you know it would just disappear suddenly, but it was always around this uh, this river in Hackistown. I don't know, I can't say the name. It it's called the M Kong, but it's uh, it it's always around this river, so. Um, I don't know. You know, I've not been up there. I was up there last year, and I went to the spot where the sightings were, and I talked to several people. Some people I had heard about it. Others thought I was nuts, and, uh, you know, so there you go. I mean, so it, it, it's something that isn't very well known, but there are people that have seen it, have heard about it, and have reported it, so... Um, hopefully I can get some more information on it down the road, but we'll see, uh, if it does come to TV, we'll see what they do with it. We can actually do a Phantoms and Monsters 14 research project on these Mantis men. 
Yeah, that would be interesting. It's it's time to get out there and start looking for these mantis men before they start coming to look for us. Well, you know, these insectoid type of uh, beings have been seen in UFO sightings, uh, and and especially there there was a there was a fairly famous case up in the Yukon of uh, three of these beings in uniform with in uh, with the uh, praying mantis like head. And uh, I, I think it was called the Canal Road uh, sighting. And this guy swore to God that you know the, he saw these three, these three beings about the size of a normal sized man, but with an insectoid heads. So um, and it's not the only one. I mean, there have been other ones. There have been other sightings as well. So uh, I don't know. We'll see. Well, let let's hopefully we get some more stuff onto this because I. I want to know more about this. Again, another topic we've been talking about for the last year, year and a half, that's really piquing my curiosity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is an interesting case. And, uh, you know, it's something, it's not something I really thought a whole lot about until I saw the, uh, you know, until I was directed to this sighting up there in uh, Hackettstown. And, um, you know, after after that initial sighting, and then the guy contacted me, and we talked about it. Um, you know, I think I really do think they saw something because there were, there were some really emotional um, uh, response to sighting. You know, the sighting of this thing. So um, hopefully, we can get some more. I hope they do find some other witnesses. That would be great. I've been posting it for them, see if they can come up, you know, somebody else that has the, uh, uh, has seen something. So if somebody has seen anything, and it doesn't okay. necessarily have to be Hackettstown, uh, let me know, and I, I, I can give you the information for the production company. Yep, they want the stories. And I guess, Lon, uh, besides insectoids and UFOs, what else we got? Well... There, there isn't a whole lot that I got this week. I, I did get one interesting story about a wandering object. Now, they, these stories I have heard previously before. I mean, now this was a new one, but I have heard accounts similar to this one. But this one had a little bit of a twist to it. So let me go ahead and read this for you. Excellent. Uh, hi, Lon. I've been reading... Phantoms and Monsters for over a year and just finished reading your second book. I really enjoyed it. I have never noticed any strange activity around me, but there has been something going on recently that I wanted to mention. Now, last summer I purchased a large lot of lithographs and prints at a farm auction in eastern Indiana. There were many fine pieces that I wanted to frame and resell, and he had in there have a gallery, and a few that I wanted to hang in my collection. There was one exceptional print of John Stuart Curry's Tragic Prelude, a well-known depiction of abolitionist John Brown. The original mural is located in Kansas State Capitol Building in Topeka. Back in May, I was laying in bed. Hold on a minute. Certainly. I just lost it. Back in, okay. Uh, back in May, I was laying in bed asleep when I heard what sounded like a squeaky human voice coming from the far wall in the bedroom in the area of my desk. I sat up in bed and switched on the nightstand light. I continued to hear the voice, but could not understand what it was saying. I looked in the direction of the desk and noticed that the wicker, wicker floor basket was shaking slightly. There were several items in the basket, including the tragic prelude print, which was rolled up in a paper paperboard storage tube. In a minute or so, the shaking stopped and the voice dissipated. I hadn't had time to frame the print, so it remained in the storage tube. There was no further activity for several months until late September. One morning, I woke at my normal time, got up, walked towards the bathroom. To my shock, the storage tube was laying across the bathroom sink. No one lives in my house and no one spent the night. I had no idea how the storage tube got into the bathroom, <clears throat> which I immediately returned to the wicker basket. 
A few days later, I returned home from work, and as I stepped into the dining room, I noticed the storage tube on end upon the old Dutch pantry shelf. I picked it up and was certain I felt some resistance. I laid it on the dining room table and then briefly stepped into the kitchen. When I walked back into the dining room, the storage tube was gone. Now, I was totally perplexed at this point. I searched through the downstairs rooms, but there was nothing there. Now, as I began to climb the stairs, I heard that squeaky voice coming from my bedroom. I slowly ascended to the upstairs level, turned right, and walked slowly into my bedroom. I looked over towards the desk in the wicker basket. The storage tube was in the basket. I sat on the bedroom. I sat on sat on the bed wondering what was going on thinking to myself that no one had access to my house how is this print moving how's it moving about the house the next day i decided to take the print to the gallery and store it there i placed it in a locked temperature controlled cabinet in my office this week i decided that i needed to frame the print and put it up for sale i just wanted to be rid of it on Wednesday, I had some spare time, so I decided to frame the print. I walked over to the cabinet and unlocked it. The storage tube was gone. It's been over 24 hours, and I cannot find the print. For some reason, I feel like it will find me at some point. I don't understand why it continues to move from place to place. And he wanted to know if I or the readers had any advice. And... This person's name was Deanna. Now, I contacted Deanna, uh, I don't know what day it was, maybe about three or four days after. It was probably Friday. No, it's Saturday. I have a Saturday. I called her. And it hadn't showed up yet. So, I don't know what's going on. You know, the first thing I thought was it may have been poltergeist activity. But, you know, you can't be certain that's what it was. You know, many, a lot of household items all shapes and sizes, they disappear. This is a common phenomenon. And many times, you know, the items will reappear at a spot where it vanished. Now, there are instances where items are collected and left at one location. I've seen that. And for whatever reason, missing dinnerware tends to end up in these uh, collection points. they got to eat somewhere. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, it's funny. Uh, many times, these collection points are found in attics. And because it, it seems that if, if it is a poltergeist or it's some type of energy moving these around, it's usually in a high area of the building. But I've also seen them behind intact walls. Is it? Wow. And uh, and the reason and I do know of one. I do know of one uh, uh, case where I worked in New, New Zealand where the gentleman had been losing objects. Couldn't find it. He happened to go into his his uh, bedroom closet and noticed that there was a small hole in the wall down by the base of, you know, behind somebody's clothes there in the base of the wall. Mm -hmm. It was about a quarter size. He looked in the hole and saw a shoebox, but he didn't know what was in it. So he took, he, you know, he, he cut the wall, his drywall. He cut a little bit of it out so he could get this thing out. And he had been missing silverware. He'd been losing silverware like crazy, and it was all in his box. Maybe you ought to start that uh, same methodology for the socks missing out of the dryer. <laughs> it might be. You know, maybe they're in someone's wall somewhere. I don't know, I, I, but it does tend to. Um, that does tend to happen. Now, I, I've heard of other cases, not cases that I've worked on. That's the first and only time it's ever happened to me. But I have heard of other cases where these. Uh, you know, where there are collection points, not necessarily in a box, but maybe a pile of things somewhere where it shouldn't be or nobody would have, would have access to. So, I don't we know. talk about poltergeists. Poltergeists are usually often entities that are created from our own subconscious. Yeah, and, and, and yeah, it's a thought. It's normally thought form, right? a thought form. It's um, now. There, there needs to be energy 
to start the thing. Now, it's usually in a, in a, a location where there has been some spirit energy or has been a haunting of some type, uh, but it's been benign. And usually, if you've got people or a person that is putting off a lot of energy, and, and for, for instance, you know, this, this adage that uh, kids that are going through puberty tend to be those that start this. Well, you know, there's there's good basis behind that because, you know, when you're going through puberty, you're going through all kinds of stuff, you know, and you got, you're thinking a lot of different things, uh, good and bad. And, you know, this may coalesce into something that actually turns into an entity. And that does happen. And most poltergeist cases are what are recognized as poltergeist cases are this coalescing or of a thought form or it's a manifestation. And uh, they're hell to get rid of. And most of the times when there is one, it, it really takes the person that is um, manifesting it to actually get rid of it. It's just not like you can't go in there and just move it. It's not like you can go in there and no. push it away either, right? You've got to. No, because uh -uh. you're not going to be able to do it. Uh, you know, it's popular for TV to see people getting rid of poltergeist. Uh, you know, just like in the movie Poltergeist. That wasn't even anything near Poltergeist, but that was supposed this to reference house is it. Clear. You know, I never did understand why they called that movie Poltergeist. It just was because catchy. things were getting moved around, I guess. But um, you know, that if that would have represented a full blown haunting and uh where you know, it was malevolent or uh spirit energy that just went haywire. That's not that's not a poltergeist case. So uh yeah, so that that's what that's what does happen. So, um, you know, th this may be a poltergeist. I don't know, but I doubt it. Uh, it's, there's something else going on here. Well, she contacted you back, or have you gotten any other? She she's not found this. Object well, as of, as of Saturday, which had been three days, uh, she hadn't it hadn't shown up anywhere. She hadn't seen it. I see. So uh, I, I will. I'm going to contact her later this week. Or, she, you know, if she does find it, I'm quite sure she'll get a hold of me. But um, I don't know. You know, I don't know. I don't know what to think of this thing. Me either. But, hey, one more interesting, unusual case to go into the Lon's X-Files. Yeah, that's logic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You never get a break. Something always going your way. I got something coming most of the time. Uh, it actually, it's been a pretty slow week as far as things coming in. But, uh you know, which is funny. I I got a uh, I got an email from Stan Gordon this morning concerning some. I and I don't know where he was, but he was he was talking. He was I don't know if he was at a conference or he was at a show of some type. Or but he said he had a lot of people coming up to him reporting flying cryptids, and uh, some of them were described as dragons, some as gargoyles. Uh, I said he had mentioned there was one, at least one from Massachusetts. Uh, so he contacted me to, to ask me if I had been hearing anything, and I hadn't heard a thing. Well, you know, these gargoyles are becoming pretty uh, prevalent, at least in Pennsylvania, you know, uh, the border of Pennsylvania, Ohio. Mm -hmm. uh, it's These gargoyles are becoming pretty, uh, pretty I don't want to say common, but they're becoming pretty repeat offenders in terms of being cited. I yeah. know Brian and Terry Siege have been interview, uh, investigating and interviewing folks who have seen a, a gargoyle-type creature. Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, there, you know, the thing up in Butler, there, there's been something seen up there several times up in Butler County, which is, uh, what, northeast of Pittsburgh. Uh -huh. uh, I, I do know there have been th some sightings up near Erie. Um... There was something sighted in West Virginia near Wheeling. Now, this was something other that I had reported, but I had heard something briefly about something that was said to look like a dragon or gargoyle a while back. So, and I don't know. I, I don't know what people are seeing. 
some of the descriptions are well i mean some of the descriptions i i have heard could easily be said to be like mothman type entities yeah I, and I you've know. been getting those kind of frequently the last few weeks yeah yeah those um you know and mothman sightings you know i hate to say that they're they're common but you know people are seeing something flying around and they've all got some decent size to them uh a lot of times they have this uh either reddish or orange glow to the head or the eyes or whatever um i don't know you know it's uh it's all it's, it's a big mystery and it's something that I, I love investigating so if people hear anything let me know about it uh, i told stan said look you know if i hear something i'll definitely let you know so uh, but apparently he's got something in the works so well, we'll we've had a lot of bigfoot activity going on in the northern part of the state again Really? Uh, sightings coming in across the northern tier. Oh, yeah, I County. just saw that. I just saw that report. Yeah. Uh, I said, yeah. now, and I, I made this comment to you in the past, once folks know that we're going out and we're investigating these areas, we're going to start getting cases. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, the cases are coming in. And a lot of what folks don't understand, and I might have said it in the past a couple weeks ago, is that this part of the state's very conservative. Mm -hmm. And there, a lot of old timers live up that way. And, and the thing with old timers is they either are do, that old and they don't give a shit about what people think. So they're going to go out there and tell everybody everything and people think they're crazy or they care too much about what everybody thinks. And they don't say anything to anybody because they don't want to be labeled crazy. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, more so, it's more so that one. And uh, we don't get a lot of reports out this way. When we're out there, and you know, it's it's all about relationship building. It really is mm -hmm. the, getting the trust. Uh, these people getting to trust us. Let us know. Letting you know by our actions, showing them we're not insane and we're not here to mess anything up, and we're here to protect their land and their property. And uh, finally, starting to get some cases coming out. So I'm excited to see where that's going to take us. Because uh, you know, we need a lot more data because Bigfoot sightings happen still doesn't give us enough data so we can move on it uh, a lot more research needs to go into this and i know the pa bigfoot society and the keystone bigfoot project and we're just committed to getting that data man we need that information well and, you know that's all well and good but the, you know now when shows come out for advocating killing bigfoot oh man yeah uh, then you know, I you know I don't I don't understand that at all. I I am I am very disappointed in something like that coming out. I just really don't understand it. It's I don't find the logic of putting on something like that on television. No, it's somebody's going to get killed. Uh, well, that's what's going to happen. And somebody's going to think they can do it, and they're going to go out there in the woods hey, and going to shoot me or somebody yeah. else out there seriously investigating this phenomena you wear blaze orange a few times a year when you're out there and it's when you have to during hunting season mm -hmm. which is normally when i don't go out anyhow just out of mm -hmm. respect for hunters so hey they don't happen to mistake me for a a bigfoot or a bear or a known animal and blow me away and i'm using me as just a reference because mm -hmm. you know, because I, I go out there and do this but i don't want to have to worry about that the rest of the year when I'm out there trying to investigate Bigfoot. And I think it's a damn shame that television channels and networks have to rely on sensationalized, drama-filled uh, shows now that sensationalize killing a Bigfoot. What the really show's going to be titled next season, it's going to be called Cancelled, with the title, Not Gonna Kill Bigfoot, But We Just Killed a Family While Camping. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And that's that's what my fear is. Someone's going to get really hurt either through the production of this show, association with this show, or because of the frame of mind it's going to put people in from watching this show. And hopefully somewhere along the line, humanity will regain their sense and will realize that shows like this just aren't even funny. There's not a damn thing, thing funny, folks, about going out in the woods trying to kill a Bigfoot, which may or may not exist, when there's actual real people out there looking for these things or out there having a good time that are lining up to be slaughtered because morons with their hunting rifles don't have anything better to do outside of hunting season. 
Well, you know, I think there will be a pushback from the community itself. Uh, I hope there is a pushback from the general public. I don't know if that's going to happen. You know, you're always going to have people that are going to say they enjoy the show and they're going to watch it just for get their jollies out of watching something like that. You know, I don't understand that. But, um, yeah, if something does happen, believe me, the, that show is going to be cited for causing it. it they're going to be somebody that says something about the show and that they thought, you know, they got the idea of we're going to go. You know, and I, I, I kind of got to imagine that there's going to ha have to be some type of um, some type of preface before the show comes on stating not to go out there and shoot a Bigfoot or don't do what we do or something to that effect. The legal uh, mandate should be is they should have to post a three-minute video per state that they're broadcasting it in showing the different gun regulations and what time of the year you're allowed to carry firearms and uh, game areas. So somebody doesn't get killed out there. Well, you know, I can't understand what state in the first place would allow somebody, a, a group of guys to go out there, if they're using rifles, to go out there and, and shoot a Bigfoot. Yeah. I mean, if they're out there filming this thing, I mean, the premise is that they're actually out there trying to do that. Now, if that is the case, then I would say that a local game com commission should have a problem with that. I, I agree with you. And I know the blowback I'm going to get this from some of our listeners on this, that, oh, you don't sound like you like guns very much. No, I grew up in central North, northern central Pennsylvania, gun land, where people use guns a lot here to uh, kill their food and, uh, unfortunately, each other occasionally up mm -hmm. in these parts. I'm just not a fan of advocating people going out in the woods with guns willy-nilly just because it seems like a good idea because they saw it on TV. Because let me tell you, there's a lot of people out there with guns that are stupid that don't know how to use them, just as well as there are out there that are well-trained that I would trust with my life. Well, you know, I'm, you know, I'm the same way. I, I was raised with a gun in my hand. Uh, I lived on a farm a lot, and a lot of the time I was a kid, and my aunt and uncles, and they had a large farm, and they had woods, and I hunted all the time. And, uh, you know, it's just something I don't do anymore. There's not a specific reason why I don't, uh, but it's just something I didn't have time to do, so I stopped doing it. I don't, I don't advocate not hunting. I mean, I... Me I, either. I'm, I'm all I for no it. I have no problem with people hunting. I like game meat. <laughs> yeah. I'm the same way, but it's just... When they come up with this type of asinine, you know, it is it, show. Exactly I mean, you know, you know it advocates show. basically killing something that is almost human, or if it isn't, if it isn't human. So you know, I don't. You, you know, my I, dad I, and I'm I. I'm just hoping this thing does not last long. My dad and I have a very, uh, well, I don't know. We we don't talk a whole heck of a lot, mm -hmm. and he saw this thing on finding Bigfoot not on killing Bigfoot and sent me this article and he goes he goes what are you planning on saying about this and I said I really don't know and the more and more I think about it the angrier and angrier I become about it because this is everything I've worked hard to prevent a show yeah. like this from having to be on television because I knew one day some morons going to say hey this is a great idea let's get out there on TV and kill the big feet you know mm -hmm. In night and uh, hmm. let me get the date straight here. Bigfootville. What year did Bigfootville come out? Mm, late nineties, some type, I think. Okay, Bigfootville really kind of sparked me into getting out into the field. I was still young at the time, nineteen ninety nine. I just started my first year of high school on mm -hmm. the fall of ninety nine. I started my first year of high school. That was the same year of Columbine. I re that's how I remember all this and. Uh, uh, I, I just remembered back then that uh, those guys shooting the guns off in the distance at the night time, I was like, wow, that's something you don't usually see on TV on mm -hmm. these Bigfoot documentaries. And that, that was kind of like, hmm, I, I don't know if I'd like that too much. And then here we are all these years later. And, uh, you know, at least that's what I'll say with shows like Finding Bigfoot. At least that they're trying to do something that's 
nonviolent productive. Right. But you know, yeah, since I agree uh, with you. Uh, 99 and I 99 Bigfootville got me really started into it again. 04 I started going into the field with the PBS. 2007 I got a call from somebody in a uh, down south left a message on the America Bigfoot Society voicemail telling me he had a couple of Gigantopithecus and that if we didn't get down there soon, he was going to start executing them. Oh, my. Yeah, and and ever since that, I, I've just been spurned not to enjoy anything remotely related to the capturing or lethal lethal attempts to take a Bigfoot. I just, it's never been, you know, I've, I'll never take one, I guess. And I've never been somebody that's been like, you know, Oh, well, let's protect these creatures. You know, they're God's creatures too, but I, I just never been somebody, you know, what folks want to do on their own time is their own business. And that if somebody wanted to take one, I wouldn't be opposed to it as long as it wasn't me. Mm. I, I, you know, I'm really, really, really starting to regret my, my, uh, position on that i'm mm-hmm. really wishing i was a little bit more forceful and you know what to take one of these creatures not just because it is a creature that should be protected because really it's doing a good job without our protection mm-hmm. but just because it's just wrong mm-hmm. you yeah know, to kill wrong. something like that that is kind of you know it's got its own sentient life and its own way of life why do you feel the need to go out and kill it just to prove to the rest of us it exists? Mm-hmm. But they're not even out to do that. They're out to kill it to turn it into a trophy. Yeah. Put it on their mantle or make a rug out of it. And I have a real issue with that. It's not benefiting science. It's benefiting their sportsmanship. It's chest beating and it's stupid. And if that's a good enough reason to kill something, well, then maybe they ought to pull that barrel around and just do us a favor and pull the trigger before they even get on TV. Well, because I think there's I've one thing. You, I, I think there's one thing you can take some solace in. First of all, they're never going to kill one on TV anyway. Well, that's and, true. And it's like finding Bigfoot; they're never going to find <laughs> one, or the show would be gone. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I guess that's why it's still called Finding Bigfoot, not Hey, we found it. Yeah. <sighs> I don't know. I, I get heated about this because yeah, it I know just bothers do. me. Over the years, it, it's gotten bothersome and i think my just my complacency has bothered me even more about it but folks that's our speak that's our speak for this portion of the program we'll be back in just a little bit with uh, our guest which we didn't even announce lon rosemary ellen guiley yes she's going to be joining us rosemary the queen of the paranormal if anybody deserves a title as such it's definitely her so stick yeah. around and we'll mistress, be right back mistress of the unknown the mistress of the unknown even better all right folks check up with us in just a little bit folks you're listening to arcane radio sean forker lon strickler with our special guest today someone that we're very excited uh is joining us uh, as Lon called her before we left uh, to come back, the mistress of the unknown. We kind of like that nickname. Uh, Miss Rosemary Ellen Guiley. And Rosemary is one of the leading experts in the metaphysical and paranormal fields, with 59 books published on a wide range of paranormal, spiritual, and mystical topics, including nine single volume encyclopedias. Her work is translated into 15 languages. Her present work focuses on spiritual growth and development, the afterlife and spirit communications, psychic skills, and dream work for well-being, working with angels, past and parallel lives, problem hauntings, entity contact experiences, and investigation of unusual paranormal activity. She has done groundbreaking research on shadow people and the jinn. Rosemary is a certified hypnotist through the International Hypnosis Federation. She has studied energy healing and completed advanced training in bioenergy. She is a reader and teacher of the tarot and is co-author with Robert Michael Place of the Alchemal Tarot and the Angels Tarot. She conducts dream work, intuition development and past life recall sessions i didn't know all this see i'm i'm reading your bio and learning a little bit more about you rosemary uh 
Rosemary leads her own multimedia company, Visionary Living Incorporated, through which she publishes some of her work in a variety of formats and also an e-newsletter, Strange Dimensions. She has regular radio features on Exploring Unexplained Phenomena with Scott Colburn and The Conspiracy Show. She is a frequent guest with George Norrie on Coast to Coast AM, with whom she co-authored Talking to the Dead about emerging technology for communicating with the dead and other beings. She is featured in documentaries and docudramas on the History, A&E, Sci-Fi, Discovery, Animal Planet, and Travel Channels. In addition, she is a popular speaker at conferences, colleges, and universities. Rosemary is a consulting editor of Fate Magazine and a board director of the National Museum of Mysteries and Research, a nonprofit educational organization in Columbia, Pennsylvania. She is a past board of director of the International Association for the Study of Dreams and a past member of the board of trustees of the Academy of Religion and Physical Research, now the uh, Academy for Spiritual and Consciousness Studies. She lives in Connecticut. And that's just a little bit about Rosemary. And we're going to talk to her about the rest of the little bit in just a few moments. But, Rosemary, thanks for joining us. We understand you've been quite busy, and we're really pleased that you could just take the time and spend a little bit of it with Lon and I. It was definitely a priority, Sean, and hello, Lon, uh, to be on this show because, uh, you know, I've worked with both of you in the past, and it's always been great. So I was really glad when our dates coincided this season, as usual, October for all of us in the paranormal, it's our Christmas season, so to speak, and so all of us uh, get to be very busy, and I've been out on the road quite a bit, uh, as well as uh, trying to keep up with my other activities, and boy, you gave everybody the full bore on that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, I learned a little bit about you that I didn't know there uh, myself, and uh, you know, especially you know the, the dream studies and that sort of things. things I'm just starting to slowly start taking an interest in it's fascinating fascinating well information. All, all of these things get interrelated and that's one thing that just keeps uh getting hammered home to me over and over again over the years that i've been doing all kinds of uh, paranormal and metaphysical research is that um all of these things are dreams our psychic experiences our uh, physical experiences and investigations, all of these things uh, bleed into each other and uh, have a lot to tell us about uh, how we're interacting with other dimensional realities. So I think it's important to take um, what I call a Renaissance man, Renaissance woman approach, uh, and that's to be uh, as well-versed as possible in many different areas. Oh, I agree. You never know when these topics uh, are going to coincide. Well, in, in a lot of cases, they always coincide. But when you have a little bit of information on a lot of different topics, you might not be quite a specialist in everything, but if you're a jack of all trades, you got a little bit of knowledge uh, to start picking and piecemealing from. It really does help. And certainly, uh, taking a broad perspective has propelled me in some um, unusual and different directions in my research over the years, and, and um, that, all, that can lead to specialization uh, in certain fields. There are some areas of these um, uh, topics that uh, I've concentrated more on uh, than others just uh, because of my own interests and also just the, the sheer weight of the material and uh, the prominence in uh, very broad-based common experiences. Uh, it's just ongoing fascinating research. I was um, over in England a few weeks ago. I was a speaker at the 6th Annual Exopolitics Conference there. And I was struck by the uh, devotion to the subject of consciousness because, you know, UFOs uh, is a field that is so heavy on the nuts and bolts side, and uh, disclosure and, and uh, hard evidence, mm -hmm. you know, crashed craft, um, physical bodies, things like that. Definitely. And to have so many presentations uh, either devoted entirely or heavily to the nature of interdimensional interactions uh, and the role of consciousness, it, uh, it was really astounding. And uh, not that we haven't had that here in North America and the United States, but um, it's often been very much in the background. 
So uh, some very encouraging trends out there across the board. Uh, more and more people who are uh, crypto hunters and paranormal investigators uh, taking interdimensionality into consideration. It's not the whole picture, but it's an important part of the picture. You know, some time ago, I spent a little bit of time in the field with Brian Seach. He's one of my favorite people to investigate with, and uh, a cryptozoologist in Pennsylvania. And uh, I, get I know a little... Brian and Perry, yes, and I agree with you. Fabulous researchers. I get a little stubborn sometimes and uh, about uh, certain things, and I get a little frustrated when I just can't figure out. And Brian always says, always pulls me aside and says to me, Sean, you just got to think outside the box a little bit. Just step back <laughs> and think outside the box. And I'm like, I know, I know, I know. And Brian's always the one that reminds me of that when we have conversations that are kind of gearing around, you know, thinking uh and other uh other forms or other possibilities he's so so good at it and he's such a good researcher i just had the name drop him there brian you're uh you're a great dude yeah and brian uh certainly deserves it he and terry have been in the field a long time oh yes uh, they are two of the most thorough researchers uh, i have known in my career and um really doing good work out there in the field very, very good work. And they, their center of crypto studies, uh, I just love following everything they're doing. They're doing some, uh, the, the uh, Butler County Gargoyle line, is that, was mm. that the gargoyle we were talking about? Yeah. Their work yeah, on that's that what case we were was awesome. Just some strange things out there that are just starting to come to light. And uh, he, he, I just talked to him on the phone the other day. He's invited me to come out to the Siege Library, as he likes to call it. They have a wealth of information. Yeah, they do. And, uh, they do. Yeah. They really do. Yeah. And they're very willing to share it with investigators. Uh, Brian's always been one of the first persons to contact me and uh, volunteer whatever information he thinks will be helpful to one of my projects. You will find a lot of my books there, too, in the library, by the way. <laughs> he was, <laughs> <laughs> Most definitely. And you've got a lot of them to put out there. What, 59 books or more now? 59 with number 60 uh, in the works. And uh, Visionary Living, uh, which is um, my own company that I incorporated uh, almost 15 years ago, back in 2000, might have been 2001, um, with the intention of uh, doing events and media and whatnot. It wasn't until the last few years that I really got it off the ground because the marketplace changed so much to make independent publishing just really viable. Uh, I had originally intended it for uh, work that major publishers would not uh, be very interested in, and uh, now I'm much more interested in, in doing all of my work this way. Um, still have a few things out there with other publishers, but um, it's um, a way to get uh, more work out faster to the public uh, and through good distribution channels. And uh, now I'm uh, also starting to publish uh, works by other authors as well, slowly, uh, because I've still got a lot of my own to deal with. But um, the marketplace has just changed, and people are getting their information in different ways, and uh, the distribution channels now are suited to, um, to speedy, effective delivery, and sometimes the big guys can't do that very well. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I prefer to get my books electronically now, mainly because my wife refuses to let me get any more bookshelves <laughs> or build any more piles of books, so it's all digital or I'm not allowed to buy it anymore. <laughs> well, I know what you mean, Sean, because it, at, at one time, uh, back in the day, I had this ambition that I was going to be the Metaphysical Library of Congress. And uh, at the peak of my collection, I had about 8,000 volumes. Well, they just literally took over the house. I had um, seven-foot oak bookcases everywhere. And uh, it was quite an impressive collection. But as I've um, moved to uh, different uh, domiciles, um, I couldn't accommodate everything out there and uh, out there on the shelves. And I had to start winnowing down my collection. So it's it's much nicer to have digital copies of things now. It is. Especially when they all yeah. fit on an iPad, you know. <laughs> well, you know, I was, uh, you know, I actually got over to my bookshelves the other day when I knew Rosemary was coming on. I'd started counting how many of her books. You know, I've got 35 of your books. 
So I oh feel my I gosh. Yeah, and I feel bad because I didn't realize you had fifty nine. Um, I'm gonna have to. <laughs> <laughs> but um, well, I only have. Star lawn. <laughs> Sorry, I only have half of your collection. <laughs> yeah. Um, What's the matter with you? <laughs> I know. I mean, I feel bad about that now. Uh, anyway, you know, you you've got this new book that you said you got coming out, the Dream Work for Visionary Living. Uh, yeah. That uh, that has sparked my interest a little bit because you you have it listed as a practical guide to proactive dreaming. Uh, you've got a workshop that you incorporate with this as well. I do, and uh, the book just came out uh, right after Labor Day, and uh, I debuted it, in fact, at some dream events that I did out in Vail, Colorado, for the Vail Symposium. And uh, since then, I've given some other uh, dream workshops with this as the foundation guidebook. Dreams have been so important to me throughout my life because uh, very, I was very young when I discovered uh, that psychic dreaming is real, mm-hmm. and this just uh, fascinated me and propelled me to explore my own dreams. Uh, and so I started studying them and from the uh, psychology perspective and from the experiential perspective, mythology, the ancient practices. So o- over my entire life and career, dreams have been an important component of creativity, uh, for well-being, and also for contact experiences. What I did with DreamWork for Visionary Living is uh, put together all of those extraordinary dimensions of dreams, that um, it's not just about understanding our ordinary dreams, and we do have to understand our ordinary daily life dreams in order to fully appreciate the extraordinary elements, but it goes into uh, how we can use dreams on a proactive basis for creativity, an inspiration for healing, for navigating through turning points in life, um, how to improve our lucid dreaming, uh, how to explore the shared dreaming landscape, that is dreaming with other people, um, astral traveling in dreams, precognitive dreams, uh, dreams of the dying, dream visits from, well, dream visits from the dead, that's a whole separate uh, uh, book in and of itself. Uh, and all of the chapters have what I call dream labs to them, uh, several exercises uh, with a suggested format for how to invite our dreams to give us valuable information for our needs of the moment. And um, people are really um, quite amazed when they start working with their dreams Mm. Um, I think, you know, the average person, if they pay any attention to dreams at all, it's, it's one of puzzlement. It's, they don't quite understand the bizarre imagery and repeating themes sometimes. But once you understand the language of dreams and how they function, uh, it's an amazing vista that opens up. Mm. Yeah, that, you know, I am fascinated by your explanation and the use of dreams, you know, in particular, now I saw where you had mentioned, now I haven't read the book yet and I plan to read it, but you had mentioned on your website about dream animals. And I was just wondering if this would be similar to, uh, shamanic journeying in particular, lower world shamanic journaling where they, they use what they call or to connect with what they call a power animal. Is it, is it similar to that? It can be. Uh, in proactive dreaming and dream journeying, and uh, we can uh, do that through incubation by setting intention, uh, some of these dreams do take on uh, similar characteristics to a shamanic journey where uh, totemic and power animals provide um, guidance and, uh, and information and spiritual assistance. And uh, animals function that way in a lot of our dreams. They often represent, um, as dream symbols, they they represent the characteristics of those animals. And they say something to us about uh, the context of the dream. So, uh, you know, dogs might be protective or guardian uh, in nature. Foxes would be clever and sly uh, and... uh, uh, 
each you know animal having its particular characteristic, which says something about the dream. Uh, so that is acting as a a dream totem. Mm-hmm. Okay, and the reason I asked this was that over the past six months or so, I've been consistently seen. I've consistently seen or heard references to owls. And, and I've talked to Sean about this in my research, writing, and just regular life. And in August, I was told that shamanic journeying may be a good source for my answers. Now, so I began to process, and you know, so far it's been enlightening. And I, and I eventually plan to use it for healing purposes with my clients. But now I, you know, I can't say for certain that you know dreams come into play with this. I, you know, I find it difficult to remember dreams. But uh, if I wanted to explore that particular avenue, well, what's available to me? Um, uh, well, about dreams in general or about the owls? Well, you both. Take away from owls and the dreams yeah. in general? <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the best things to do to explore dreams are to, first of all, understand how dreams speak to you uniquely. And, and dreams share a common ground. Uh, Carl Jung explored this quite well with his concept of the collective unconscious and with archetypal figures in dreams. Um, he he went far beyond the associations uh, that Freud gave to dreams and seeing dreams as connecting us to this vast pool of consciousness shared by human beings throughout history and then to something transcendent beyond that. So... Um, when we start working with dreams, just uh, paying attention to them every night uh, and writing them down and, and uh, interpreting them, uh, that begins an alchem- literally an alchemical process uh, of enfoldment in which um, we start to explore our own inner depth. Uh, we come to a greater understanding of um, how dreams are speaking to us Dreams are about balance in, in life. They reflect to us our true feelings about uh, how we're doing in life and how we think we're doing in life. And then they also connect us to these transcendent realms. Uh, so the way to get started is to just start paying to attention to dreams on an everyday basis and um, realizing that they speak in an intuitive, holistic way, um, mm-hmm very seldom in a literal way. So you, you have to do a lot of right brain work. You kind of have to switch your thinking modes. And uh, they tell us a lot about, um, it, it's kind of like our radar and barometer at the same time. Uh, and from there, we get uh, these other more subtle uh, levels of um, spiritual guidance that the the dream it's like an onion there's an obvious personal meaning to us then there are these um, more subtle spiritual meanings of dreams uh, to us and um, uh, that's where the real uh, enrichment comes in mm. okay well i'm going to definitely read your book i uh it, it does it does fascinate me that, you know when i started reading this you know i i i have thought about looking into dreams as far as what I do and, you know, to see what, you know, maybe I could do it, but I am definitely going to get your book and read that. Now, you, I, I know that you are a believer in angels. And yes. uh, is, is that a result of a personal revelation? Well, what some of my early childhood experiences were with angels, and um, I always believed in them as a kid. Uh, some of it was from religious exposure. Uh, I my parents were very active in the Methodist Church, and uh, so you know I got the Sunday schooling and all that. And um, you know we, there's an emphasis on angels at Christmas time, but to me, uh, angels went far beyond that. They seemed to be around all the time, and I had um, pleasant experiences feeling angels around me when I was a kid. So as I got older and began studying uh, contact experiences of all kinds, I was particularly interested in uh, the literature involving angels and uh, found many experiences that corroborated some of my own and also revealed patterns of experiences that human beings have had 
throughout the ages, not just with angels, but with angel-like beings, you know, helping uh, beings who seem to be intermediaries between human beings and the Godhead. Uh, we've gone through cycles in our interest in angels and even an evolution in our beliefs about angels from the biblical times uh, where the average person uh, didn't believe that, I mean, believed that angels rarely visited people unless they were sent by God, usually for some sort of uh, disciplinary or, or big purpose, uh, to today where um, many people believe in angels uh, and that they are around us all the time mm -hmm. and are very accessible to us for spiritual guidance. Mm. Well, you know, I, 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 I've got my own theory on angels now. Let me, I'm just going to mention it to you and just tell me what you think. I, I do believe that angels are celestial energy that are attached to us at birth. And, and I think it grows, develops, and matures as we get older. I mean, to the point where each of us has the ability to transform that energy into a conscious being capable of connecting to a divine source. Now, you know, of course, what the divine source is, that's a question that may never be answered but even understood. But I feel that each person has an original description for a divine source, regardless of any religious indoctrination it, it's just a matter of making it available and properly using it for your journey throughout life and beyond that's that's what i teach people that come to me uh, or ask me about angels uh do you think i'm on the right track there uh it certainly certainly is a valid track and you know i I uh, think that there are many approaches to our understanding of, of these beings in terms of what exactly they are. And the way you've described them certainly fits within, I would say, the broad concepts that uh, most people have about angels. Some of our beliefs have gotten to be quite specific uh, in Western culture, but when you go beyond that, uh, the picture broadens out quite a bit. Uh, and there do seem to be these celestial or heavenly uh, vibrations or emanations or personifications that have interacted with human beings throughout our entire history. Mm -hmm. And they, they seem to have very consistent functions. Uh, I think we've tended to personalize them a lot uh, in recent times, and I, by recent times I'm saying since the mid-20th century. Um, and I think that's just part of the nature of, of our 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 ways of trying to interact with something that um, has no known exact provable form um, but seems to be present and capable of manifesting uh, to people. Mm. I um, Do you think there's an in any instances where angels and benevolent beings or demons, like people call demons, seem to be one the same? There certainly is a blurring and an overlap. Um, and uh, part of the thing about demons is uh, we, we really have to broaden our outlook on demons as well. Uh, we've come to think of them as um, a very narrowly defined kind of entity that's um, completely evil, and uh, under satanic uh, leadership and has certain activities and purposes for subversion of the soul and, uh, you know, the horrible tormenting of, of people. Mm -hmm. But in the ancient views, and this would be globally uh, in the spirit lore of whatever culture you look at, there are these classes of uh, intermediary slash interfering uh, beings um, which we could class as demons, and they range from even um, uh, good to to the evil, uh, that uh, there were entities that could be called upon for, for help. They weren't angels, but they were helping, you know, uh, could help in various capacities. Ambivalent ones, tricky ones, um, mal malevolent ones, and evil ones. And malevolent, um, I define as, you know, hostile hostile intent. You can be hostile without being evil. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, the ancient demonic universe was quite 
um, rich and diverse. And um, beings are described in uh, various compilations uh, that have been attempted over the centuries of uh, kind of uh, blending or overlapping in, in characteristics. Um, a particular entity might be good here and bad there or views of a change over time. And uh, we find the same with angels, that um, angels uh, in ancient accounts uh, are often described as hostile to people uh, and not a particularly uh, benevolent disposition, but yet they're still part of the angel realm. If you consider that the the function of the angel realm is the maintenance of cosmic order, this is a concept that seems to be very consistent with descriptions of angels and angel-like beings, that their role is to maintain cosmic balance and order, then... Um, that may involve situations where um, they might be hostile to human beings who are upsetting the cosmic order. And we certainly find many accounts of that uh, from the the old, um, uh, e- even from biblical times, um, in, um, even in the Bible and in literature outside the Bible, the ex-canonical literature and in the, the uh, uh, Jewish uh, angelology and Merkaba literature as well, that there are angels who are not kindly disposed toward people. And um, that runs very much against the the popular prevailing view of angels of being all good, all benevolent, um, almost to the point where it's kind of syrupy um, and perhaps not very realistic. Well, you know, in... in um, there was a TV show that started this past year, and I, I forget the name of it. But anyway, I, I Dominion. had been watching it. What's that? Yeah, it was called Dominion. Yeah, Dominion. Um, it, it, the show kind of does convolute what angels really are in my in my thinking. I know it's a lot of Old Testament stuff there, but it it, it kind of blurs, like you said, what people think of it. Did, did you? Uh, what did you get out of the show? Have you watched it? I've watched a few episodes of it, and um, I I didn't cotton to it as well as I thought I might. I was uh, looking forward to it as something that um, kind of reset the you know the bar and challenged prevailing uh, beliefs about angels to reveal some of their darker nature. But I found just some of some of the characters uh, kind of uninteresting, and also the plot was just kind of tedious. So uh, I haven't seen it in quite some time. Um, the idea of hostile angels um, working against people uh, is certainly not new by any means. But mm-hmm. uh, in the biblical portrayals of that, um, angels are really ambivalent. They're neutral, and they're they're really God's bouncers and and uh, hit men uh, when they need to be, and God's healers when they need to be. It's, uh, they're completely at the disposal of the divine word. And, uh, you know, we have the example of the Passover angel uh, who is directed to, uh, to slay the male firstborns in every household mm-hmm. uh, and who goes about doing so dispassionately uh, because that's, uh, that's the decree of... of uh, of what you know they're ordered to do, and angels who have meted out warnings, and uh, then on the flip side of that, you have angels who come to deliver good messages. Uh, but even when when the uh, archangel Gabriel appears to Mary in the New Testament, this does carry over into the New Testament. Uh, Mary is is put off by the appearance of this angel. She's kind of uh, frightened at first, because mm-hmm. in those times, the appearance of an angel uh, usually meant, um, you know, God was upset with you. And so the angel says, fear not. You know, the angel has come to, to deliver an important message and not to warn or, or mete out some sort of divine punishment. Mm. Now, let's get a little more darker. <laughs> uh you know, I know you and John Zappas have collaborated on a couple of books, and uh, I don't want to ask you, what is the status of modern-day demonology as compared to maybe earlier times 
when demons were blamed for almost every bad occurrence? Uh, well, um, I, I think that demonology, again, today has gotten to be very narrowly defined. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, someone who uh, deals with these satanic beings, uh, and, you know, <clears throat> thanks to Christianity that we have this skew on, on demons to begin with, that they're all, right. all minions of Satan, uh, deals with these satanic entities who whose only purpose is to latch on to people and begin this deterioration from infestation to possession uh, when they can, but at least uh, to destroy uh, someone's life. And uh, what demonology doesn't adequately explain is, uh, in, in all cases is why this happens in the first place. Mm-hmm. Uh, there seem to be cases where people can invite, you know, um, trouble from dark entities. But then we have examples where people uh, didn't seem to do that, at least consciously. And so there's kind of a convoluted argument that they're, you know, sacrificial lamb examples of the potential of, of you know, the demonic to right. destroy. Uh, not quite satisfying. But demonologists... Uh, we'll take on negative cases where there seem to be uh, very hostile entities who are attached to people and environments and, uh, you know, attempt to uh, to resolve uh, the situation. Um, the demonologists that I know uh, work with a variety of spiritual remedies and, and religious practices, and they all have their own particular favorites in terms of of how these cases need to be handled. Uh, now, if if you if you had a person who came to you suspecting they had a, a haunted object, what would you tell them to first do? Uh, first, um, I would have to ascertain, uh, you know, why. Uh, they think this object is haunted. Right. Uh, um, what happened uh, after they acquired the object and brought it into their environment um, that changed? And with, uh, with these cases, there's a certain pattern uh, of activity. And uh, John and I talk about this in Haunted by the Things You Love, which is a collection of um, some of his unusual cases drawn from uh, from his haunted museum. Uh, a person will acquire an object that has uh, a, a spirit attachment, sometimes a curse attached to it, but let's just say a, a spirit attachment. And uh, quite often the the person will feel that something is very odd or off about this object. Uh, they'll get an intuitive uh, indication that there's a problem, but they won't know what it is, and they override it because they've simply got to have whatever this thing is for a variety mm-hmm. of reasons. So they bring it into to their environment. It could be clothing, jewelry, uh, collectibles, furniture, uh, just about anything. And then uh, there will be uh, either an explosion of paranormal activity that had not been present before, or it will gradually creep and escalate shadows, apparitions, cold breezes and spots, phantom voices, uh, phantom music, uh, nightmares, feelings of being watched, objects moving around, uh, relationships um, uh, disintegrating through arguing and, uh, you know, things like that. And this activity will escalate, and sometimes physical health is affected as well. Uh, until they finally put two and two together and uh, say, hey, none of this happened before um, I brought X into the house. Uh, And so people like John or myself will get called. Uh, Sometimes people won't even associate it with with an object. They'll just have this um, sudden eruption of unpleasant activity, and um, they go looking for help. So uh, if we know what the object is, uh, or we suspect what it is, uh, then we can uh, get to the bottom of it faster. We don't have to go through a process of elimination. And uh, removing the object from the premises will almost always bring relief. In the cases of cursed objects, 
Uh, it doesn't sometimes because a cursed object will often come with like a Trojan horse spirit that is then unleashed into the environment and it latches onto the environment and the people in it. Mm. Uh, and then other steps are taken to uh, to neutralize the object. Uh, sometimes um, um, you have to go to extreme measures of binding, uh, bind a spirit to an object uh, so that it doesn't act out. Um, sometimes objects have to be buried or disposed of in deep water. Hmm. Um, now I know you worked with John on on the this book. What can you recall? Maybe one of the one story that stands out to you. Well, uh, they're all kind of unique in in various ways, but um, one that struck me as highly unusual uh, involved a mirror. Uh, mm that and oftentimes people will find these objects in the state shops, yard sales and whatnot. Um, but a couple uh, found this mirror um, kind of not not a real antique but old. Um, and they bought it at a yard sale and put it in their dining room. And um, activity started in the house. Now the wife was a total skeptic and non believer in anything paranormal and the husband was kind of neutral or ambivalent, uh, and he was the primary experiencer, which is not uncommon for one person to be a focal point in a household. And uh, when other people in the household experience nothing to very little, it's easy for them to dismiss the whole thing as all in the other person's head, and that's what happened in this case. What made it unusual, uh, now in mere cases where uh, mirrors are... Uh, in problem hauntings. Um, they have been known for a long time as potential doorways to the spirit world, uh -huh. and that um, when they are used in the wrong place in the wrong way, spirits can come through them and access a place. Well, the husband started seeing all these shadow figures in the house, and um, he, if he tried to focus on them, uh, they would immediately start um, heading for the dining room. And if he made it to the dining room fast enough, he would see them go into the mirror. He never, ever saw them come out. He only saw them go in. And I have, uh, I've never heard of a case like that where you only see the figures going into the mirror instead of coming out. Usually people will, uh, will see th things come out of a mirror. Mm. Uh, so... That made it a little unusual, and the wife never never saw these things. They had uh, poltergeist stuff that uh, objects got rearranged, and even though she had no explanation for that, uh, she still wouldn't believe that the mirror was haunted, and he kept telling her there's something wrong with that mirror. Well, he started having nightmares, and in the nightmares, these blobs, which is what he called the shadow things, uh, were telling him not to trust certain people in his life, relatives and friends, that they were actively working against him, and he would wake up with this horrible feeling of foreboding. Uh, so the marriage was probably not in that good a shape to begin with, but um, uh, the bottom line of it was that uh, after John was called in and uh, the mirror was, was taken out, um, their relationship had deteriorated to the point where they, the couple split up. Uh -huh. uh, however, taking the object out of the house did not uh, affect a link that these entities had to the husband. And he continued to have nightmares. They split up. He moved into an apartment. He continued to have the nightmares with these blobs. And also this foreboding that something dreadful was going to happen to him. Well, a lot of times people, um, they won't allow you to help them all the way. They'll mm -hmm. come and ask for help, and then uh, you can get them to a partial resolution or what seems to be closure, and then something else develops, and then they, um, they either don't want any more help or they fall off the radar. Wow, and I've been through that. I know that for a fact. 
Oh, yeah, that ju- just happens all the time for yeah. a variety of reasons. Well, so John heard from this man intermittently, but this guy didn't want any more help. He told John that he was still having the nightmares. And then John heard um, that um, within a, a passage of time, it was like a couple of years after uh, the whole thing started, that um, he died. In, uh, he was a motorcyclist, and he died in a highway accident. Um, and so it, it just leaves this question open of, uh, you know, were these beings, did these beings get um, a hook into him that they, um, they participated in his demise? Were they trying to give him, uh, even though they were dark, uh, beings with a, a negative energy? Were they trying to give him warnings through his dreams? They kept telling him not to trust his family members, and nothing ever happened with members of his family. He had good relations with his uh, family. Uh, nothing hmm. ever bad ever happened with him. It's almost like a Ouija board communication, you know, Yeah. Uh, where pe- people are encouraged to be paranoid. Yeah, you, you wonder if it was some type of attachment that he received or, um, you know, a residue to what was going on with the mirror. You know, that, that when you mentioned that they never saw anything come out of the mirror, that is odd because that's normally where it starts at. Uh, you know, you, I, I don't know of a case where, you know, an entity has been seen, but when recognized heads for the mirror. Or, you know, and, and it's, it's usually a mirror because, I mean, I've had several cases that have involved mirrors. And uh, that's that's odd. That really is odd. But um, it, it was strange in that regard. Uh, and you know, he, he would uh, try watching the mirror uh, to see if anything would come out. And of course, you know, it's uh, you, you watch for something and then it won't happen. So he never saw anything coming out. Uh, and... Uh, as I'm sure you found, Lon, in, in cases with badly placed mirrors, they're often in bedrooms. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they, they face the, the sleeper in uh, some bad energy way, or he's got mirrors that look into each other. Uh, so, uh, as is often the case with these objects, it's difficult to ascertain how or why it got to be affected in the first place. Mm-hmm. So, what was the history behind this mirror? Uh, there's often no way to trace it. Did did somebody? It was an, an ordinary looking mirror. It looked like it should be hanging on a wall. It was ornate. It had a nice cherry wood frame. Um, it wasn't like a, a ritualized mirror, you know, that someone had um, painted or decorated uh, for obvious occult ritual. So what happens to an object like that, and how does it become such um, an, a gateway for these dark, threatening figures? Um, and in most cases, uh, we never know the complete history. In cases yeah. of curses, sometimes we can trace it back to, to the origin. But um, it, it was just a sad story all the way around. Well, you know, you mentioned uh, about people placing mirrors in bedrooms where it's faced toward the bed or they have a mirror hanging on a door that's faced toward the And I do tell people myself, do not, even a mirror on a dresser, move it to away from looking at you on the bed. You know, it's almost like they pick up somebody's life and pick up their frailties or whatever. I, it just seems to me that it just comes to life. Um, you know, and then, and what, for whatever reason, if the, the mirror, has this, does become like a portal that it can use whatever it detects about a person uh, against them. You know what I'm saying? I it just seems that way to me. And but I do I do tell people when they you know if they've got a mirror and if you can't put it anywhere that it's not facing the bed, don't use it. Put it someplace else. I have uh, no mirrors in my bedroom, mm-hmm. uh, and. Uh, you know, some people live in, in places where um, the the entire closet, uh, the sliding glass doors on closets are mirrors. Mm-hmm. I lived in a place like that, and I never liked it. Uh, I just felt that it was not um, beneficial energy at night. Nothing bad ever happened to me in that place, but um, 
I didn't feel comfortable mm-hmm. uh, with it like that. Mirror shouldn't uh, be at the foot of the bed. They shouldn't be at the head of the bed. Uh, now, I do a lot of work with black mirrors. And I, teach and I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> well, I teach uh, black mirror scrying, and that is uh, an entirely different aspect of mirror work. Uh, for one thing, you're dealing with black mirrors instead of reflective mirrors. There's something about the silvered mirrors that I think is especially conducive to, to being a portal, a portal in. Mm. Whereas with a black mirror, you're, going, um, you're using the mirror as um, a surface or to even go into the mirror in order to get information. It's, it's a more controlled um, kind of activity uh, that you, you engage with it as a tool uh, to open up the psychic sense for uh, communication with the dead and entities and astral travel, Akashic records, past life viewing. It's powerful because uh, things can arise in the mirror uh, that, in very stark ways, that um, can unsettle some people. So it's it's a type of psychic work that uh, is quite strong, but um, um, it's it's different from these silvered mirrors that um, that. I, I don't know whether it's um, something in the silvering that uh, it, it reflects uh, everything in such detail, and then when when it's in the wrong place, um, magnifies these these occult energies. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, silvered mirrors go back to about the 1830s, and. From that point on, in, at least in Western culture, that's where we have a lot of folklore arising mm-hmm. um, about mirrors and right. that uh, they have to be covered when someone dies in a household, um, that they're portals to the spirit world. So something happened with the advent of these silvered surfaces that interacts with the spirit realms in certain ways. Hmm. You know, I... Um... You know, I was going to ask you about the the black mirror scrying because I know people that have used crystals uh, before have gone to the black mirror scrying. Now I really don't know why, but they say it's easier to use. Uh, I don't know. You know, they've also those are also people that use use tarot as well. Um, so what would you, what do you use it for in particular? Well, it can be used in paranormal investigation, but oh, really? uh, well, those would be in settings where you would have more of a seance. You know, you would want to use it as part of a seance mm-hmm. um, method of communicating. Uh, I have worked with some uh, paranormal groups who have uh, one or two mirrors for the group, and uh, if they they want to do some sort of a seance setting, uh, the mirror will evoke information, and um, it's. It's a different kind of tool that some people find to be uh, very effective, and uh, it's often a surprise, uh, since this is really old technology that uh, is still good today, and uh, a lot of people just just haven't tried it out. So I started using the Black Mirror um, to exper- years ago um, to experiment with visioning. Uh, to uh, divine the future or the, uh, look into the past, uh, to contact the spirit world. And then um, when Raymond Moody came out in the 1980s with his book uh, Reunions, which <clears throat> I think that might have been the early 90s. Yeah, I come to think of it, the early 90s. Reunions about his use of the black mirror that he called the psychomantium process for uh, closure, you know, grief uh, processing, communication with the dead. Right. Uh, that piqued my interest. And uh, so I began experimenting with it as a way of communicating, particularly with the dead. And uh, I took some workshops from uh, Dr. Moody. I went down to his house in Alabama. I went through his personal psychomantium, which was a day-long process. And uh, then I took some workshops from him and some training uh, from him in uh, facilitating black mirror uh, scrying for uh, for others. But I always saw the uses as far greater than 
um, contacting the dead for closure. That's very mm-hmm. important. And uh, when when people ask me for a personal session, which I do lead personal sessions in Black Mirrors, it's usually for that. It's to contact uh, a dead loved one. But uh, when when I teach it in workshops, uh, it's uh, so useful for astral traveling, um, going into the Akashic records, contacting all kinds of entities, and um, uh, past life exploration as well. It's also um, a good tool just for developing the psychic faculty. You know, like like any tool, you know, the tarot is, dowsing rods are, um, you know, and any kind of work like that will sharpen up the uh, clairvoyant faculties. Mm. Sean, do you have anything? Did you tell Rosemary about the time we were in Phenomicon and uh, the guy with the Ouija board sat down next to you? And (laughs) Rosemary, I've never seen Lon so uncomfortable in my life. Like he was crawling out of his skin. Like he he kept looking at me. He's like, you got to get these damn things away from me. He goes there. And they were Ouija boards of all shapes, sizes, ages. They were just some of the weirdest looking boards. When I was in high school, I had a, a remarkable experience with a spirit board when I was at a party. And um, since then, I've been very wary of Ouija boards, so much so that I, if there are bad vibes, I get I get off some of them. That's not all of them. This particular one at Phenomicon, I don't know what, it hadn't been cleansed, but it was awful. I It was really bothering me. And uh, I mean, is, is that a normal reaction to people that are intuitive that you found? Well, my take on the Ouija board is that it's like any tool, it's neutral. And I think um, um, people in general have been conditioned to view them as negative by Hollywood and by, um, you know, the thunderings of various uh, religious people and and certain demonologists Mm -hmm. who consider them to be a welcome mat to Satan. Um, the board in its early history had uh, a benign beginning and uh, over the years had kind of a checkered history. I mean, people used it for crazy things. And um, some people have had terrifying experiences with the Ouija board. It's It seems to open up psychic pathways a lot faster than a lot of other tools. And um, if there are opportunistic uh, negative entities around, it's, it seems to be easier for them to, to dive bomb uh, people and, and even get attached. Whether or not these individuals uh, would have the same issues if they had attempted other uh, forms of spirit communication, hard to say, but the Ouija board opens things up very, very fast. Mm-hmm. It looks mysterious. It has a mysterious uh, aura to it and a mystique, uh, and I consider it, out of all the the tools, to be the most problematic because of um, people's skittishness around it and uh, unpredictable uh, reactions and experiences. Um, I've used one I, since I was a kid, not regularly. I've, I've never had um, a terrifying experience. I've had um, you know negative entities come through and either waste time or you know swear, uh, but I've had that over the ghost box and other methods of communication too, and and then I've interviewed people who uh, have had uh, you know literally evil demonic uh, activity and attachments that um, came as as a, a result of having used the board. So um, it's it's definitely got um, you know this this checkered personality and history to it. I don't consider it inherently bad, however. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I um, no, it's just like they got this movie out now called Ouija. I don't even know if it has anything to do with the you know with the Ouija board, or other than you know. They used it. Uh, I, I, it can't be good, or they wouldn't have made a movie. Uh, I, I can't believe 
So, I mean, did you watch the movie? Have you seen it? I, I haven't seen it. I've only seen the promos. Yeah. Uh, Robert Murch, who's um, you know one of the leading uh, historians on the Ouija board, he consulted on that, and um, the movie had to be made with the approval of Hasbro because that's a trademark term, sure. Ouija. Uh, but yeah, the way Hollywood treats the board is that it's uh, a door opener to the terrifying and the demonic. Uh, the movie Witchboard was particularly bad in that regard. <clears throat> that case was uh, 1986, and um, that was a scenario where the young people gather, um, and there's this made-up folklore about how the board uh, enables spirits to to come into uh, the room, and uh, this malevolent entity manifests on the board, and then starts killing people. You know, it. it uh, is able to latch into the physical reality and it starts killing people one by one. Uh, uh. And uh, that movie probably did more to damage uh, the Ouija board than even The Exorcist, um, <laughs> which also had a terrifying effect on people. Right. So uh, I've sometimes wondered if, if we'll ever recover uh, or rather, will the Ouija ever recover its original neutrality, which was as a, a tool for family entertainment? Yeah. Contact the spirit world. You know, have fun in your living room. You know, contact the spirit <laughs> world. Um, I And I doubt it. I, I think we're so poisoned yeah. against it that um, the board will will never get over it, over that uh, demonic association. Well, you know, I... This, this occurrence... This, uh... Uh, experience I went through was back in the mid 70s and uh, you know a lot of people in fact my dad used to sell them he used to sell them in his store so I mean it, you know I know he wouldn't now but um, you know I, I, I know a lot of people had used them I mean I used them when I was a kid you know you play around with it and if it works it works or it doesn't it doesn't but you know this this one experience was pretty dramatic and uh, ever since then, I've just had, I have had no good feeling about it whatsoever. And for whatever reason, it seems that whenever I get near one, I start getting a read on it somehow. And I, I don't know what it is. It's, um, most of the time, it's not good. And it just, it just kind of makes me want to just push away from it. So I don't know. I don't know if that's an unconscious reaction to it or whatever, but, um. Uh, uh, it's just that, you know, it, it stuck with me. Well, what was your experience? This oh, was uh, back in the 70s? Yeah, I was at a party uh, in high school, and there was a bunch of, uh, there was a bunch of us at this friend of, this house, a friend of mine, we were in the basement. And um, I was sitting on the sofa talking to this girl, and right in front of us on, on, uh, a small coffee table and somebody had a Ouija board there. So there was a bunch of them sitting around, uh, drinking. I'll admit we were drinking beer and it, it was, uh, they were playing with the Ouija board and I kept watching this guy that was across the table from me watching this girl that was sitting in front of me. He was giving her all kinds of crazy looks. And uh, she started complaining that somebody had grabbed her breast, but nobody was doing it. I mean, and somebody had rubbed her back or something, and she was really freaked out. I mean, something, you know, something that had to have happened to her. And this guy sitting there across the way looking at her, giving these, these smirking smiles. And I was looking right at him, and in my mind, I just told him to stop it. And when that happened, he shot a glance at me. Uh, look, I mean, it was like the devil himself looking at me. He got up and started running towards me. And I grabbed him. I kind of moved away and grabbed him and pulled him down on the sofa. And me and another guy, another guy came to my aid. We held him down. He didn't have to hold him down long. He snapped out of it. And he apologized and everything. He said he didn't know what came of it. And 
we were there, I don't know, we may be sitting there for a couple minutes, and all of a sudden the girl who f- said she was grabbed screamed and was pointing towards the planchette, which was about two or three foot, hovering two or three foot above the Ouija board in the air, freestanding free in the air. And everybody flipped out. They all ran toward the other side of the... Uh, the other side of the uh, the basement by the bar, I was standing there a little closer to. I wanted I wanted to see what was going on. This thing was just hovering. This planchet was just hovering about two or three feet above the board, and all of a sudden, it slammed down on the board with such a force that it blew all the bottles and glasses off the table and broke the planchet. Oh yeah. I mean, you didn't have to say anything. Everybody started running up the stairs out the door. Uh, it was the damnest thing I've ever experienced as far as any type of, you know, something like that. But, you know, it, it just happened that the girl, now when I found out later, the girl had died or had died in an attack on a rape or whatever. I don't know the extent, but not many years later in Texas. And, uh, there was the other guy, not that guy who attacked me, but somebody else swore to God that he, he had been possessed for years after that happened. So I don't know how true all that is, but I saw this thing react the way it did. I had no that, idea what it was. Amazing. Uh, first of all, for the planchette to be able to levitate, yeah. uh, that much, that high and, uh, sustained, you know, not just like a quick up and down. Yeah. Uh, and to be witnessed by so many people, that's uh, an extraordinary story. There, uh, I have had other cases that have similar elements to that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, that's that's what happened. It's you know, I didn't really like to talk a whole lot about it, but it's because uh, it always stuck with me. Because I, I feel that that has a big. I mean, a large basis to why I have this infinity against Ouija boards. So, I don't know. Well, um, sometimes when people have, like, just one exposure like that, and it it turns freaky, uh, yeah, ever after that, and people do not want to touch it. I, uh, I've interviewed people where... They've never used a board before, and then they encounter it, often at a party situation like that. Mm-hmm. Something weird happens, and then that's it. Um, you may might be familiar with, um, you know, Darren Evans, who uh, he's had his story out for some time now about the entity Zozo, mm-hmm. uh, who contacted him on the Ouija board and then was able to latch on to him and and he uh, follow him around, and his health deteriorated. Uh, he had um, haunting phenomena in his home, things acting out against his family. Uh, it, it got to be a, a terrible case. Um, in um, Ouija Gone Wild, which is uh, the book that Rick Fisher and I did, right. um, and we take a stance in the book that the board itself is neutral, um, but nonetheless, uh, there are more freaky stories about the Ouija than there are other kinds of um, spirit communication interaction tools. Uh, so are there, my, my speculation is that uh, there's something about how it opens people up and the way uh, spirits can communicate, because you're using the body in a very dramatic way, Mm-hmm. Um, that this makes it easier for certain um, low-level opportunistic entities who may even hang around, you know, um, the energetics of this, this sort of thing. Uh, these devices are often used by uh, young people um, who are wanting to be entertained or, you know, like they've been drinking, want to have a good time or even a thrill. But still, it, that doesn't explain away all of these mm-hmm. weird stories. The uh, story that we we open up the book with uh, involves a young woman who became fascinated uh, by the Ouija board, got lots of results with it, uh, with friends, and then they got bored, but she was so obsessed with it that she started using it by herself. And the the entity that was communicating with her 
uh, did the predictable darker and darker turn uh, and sexually suggestive and um, threatening uh, messages. And uh, she would have episodes where the planchette would fly off the board and start snaking up her leg. Mm. Mm. Wow. Mm. Wow, that's incredible. Well, guys, we've been jaw-jacking here for an hour and six minutes, and we're out of time. <laughs> All this great information you guys have been putting out there with the tales of Ouija board and Lon getting chased by uh, possessed men, and uh, it's, it's Rosemary, it's always fun to have you on the program. Well, it's uh, great, Sean, and I sure appreciate talking uh, to both of you and... Uh, I hope to share it again sometime soon. Most definitely. You're always welcome on our program, Rosemary. Lon, any final thoughts? Yeah, you got to tell us about your new radio show, Rosemary. Um, I've postponed developing it pending. uh, I'm rethinking my format, Mm -hmm. and um, I don't have the time to do a weekly show. Right. So I'm probably going to, uh, I well, no, I, I am going to do something once a month. And um, I was going to have a certain format and approach, and then I started rethinking that. And um, uh, But I'm probably going to do like you, is to uh, pre-record and then um, um, post it. Uh, because tying me down to a live schedule, even once a month, <laughs> to be I problematic. Yeah. But what I, what I want to do with this show, and I'm calling it Strange Dimensions Radio, I was going to uh, debut it uh, last month, and then the logistics uh, just started getting away from me, and I thought, well, I really need to, to do more planning here. Uh, I, I want to um, have different kinds of shows, and uh, some of them are going to focus on uh, leading investigators and researchers talking about some of their um, stranger cases or lesser-known aspects of their work and their lives, uh, I want to go way below the surface uh, and dig out some some really interesting things about what what goes on out there in the paranormal. So Strange Dimensions Radio, uh, I'm now looking at a January 2015 debut for it. That will give me a little more time to... Uh, get all my ducks lined, my delivery ducks lined up, <laughs> and um, uh, start uh, producing. But I've been asked for a long time yeah. uh, when I'm going to do something. So mm-hmm. it, it seemed like, uh, I, you know, the time is right now to do it. Well, very good. And I, I encourage everyone to get uh, Rosemary's monthly newsletter strange dimensions very good it's got a lot of cool stuff in there i look at it every month um can you tell everyone how to get that rosemary yes you can go on my home page of my website visionaryliving.com and sign up there and uh, i also keep sign up sheets at, at my events um you can also drop me an email reguiley at gmail.com the website's the easiest way and, Lon, coming from you with your fabulous uh, Phantoms and Monsters um, blog, uh, that's quite a compliment. I really appreciate it. I don't know how you managed to do Phantom, Phantoms and Monsters, um, you know, putting something out uh, just about every day there. It's, that, too, is a wonderful compilation. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, I don't know how I do it either, to be honest with you, <laughs> but I, I get it done. But, no, thanks a lot. Now, and you, really, your newsletter is great. It's got a lot of cool stuff in there. And I've, I've used some of it uh, in, in some of the things I do, and uh, I look forward to it every month. Well, thank you. That's the, the best compliment and, uh, you, you can make to it is, is that it's usable. Yes. And uh, I, I try and cover, um, you know, the different things that I get involved with, Um and I, I almost warn people sometimes, you know, that, um, well, you might be interested in dreams, but my newsletter, you know, might cover werewolves sometimes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I'm into everything. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, I, thanks again for being on with us, Rosemary. Definitely. I love talking to you every time. And I, 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 I'm going to go ahead and uh, 
uh, change the mistress of the unknown to the lovely mistress of the unknown. <laughs> so you can put that you can put that moniker up there now. Uh, it's always great to have you with us. Well, thank you, Lon and Sean. Great talking with you in this Halloween month, and uh, have a good one. You too, Rosemary. Take care, folks. Now. Rosemary Ellen Guiley, Rose, uh, VisionaryLiving dot com. Correct, Lon. Yes. All right. Folks, you've been listening to Arcane Radio, Sean Forker, Lon Strickler. We'll see you next week. Good night, everybody.